Welcome. Welcome to my show, ladies and gentlemen, Sex and Circumcision, an American Love Story. That's a bizarre title, huh? I thought so. Now, my name is Eric Klopper. Most people call me Klopper because it's more original, but you can call me whatever you'd like. I grew up as a Jewish guy in a relatively affluent suburb of Boston. Now, to kick off my show, I would like to start with a quote from one of the most influential intellectuals of our time, Noam Chomsky. The smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow lively debate within that spectrum. Thanks, Noam. So we can visualize this with a simple diagram. Here is the spectrum of acceptable opinion for our culture. Inside the spectrum, all of our culture's acceptable opinions live. Now, this spectrum obviously expands, and I think most of us would agree, evolves over time. So for example, in this spectrum, we now find civil rights, women's suffrage, and gay marriage. And that's only a few years old. We've come a very long way, but I think we can all agree we have much further to go. That is why I wrote this show, to continue to expand the spectrum. Now, to facilitate this expansion, I have compiled a list of facts. I have modestly named them Klopper's Five Censored Facts. <laughs> now, these facts are demonstrably true. They're facts you're not supposed to know. I can't just reveal them to you. They fall well outside the spectrum. But I can show you how they're true. I will walk you through each of them, and then at the end, you get to hear what I really think as we start drawing overarching conclusions about our culture and others. That is the point of my show. Now, I'm always a little nervous before my shows, and this one was no exception, but I actually feared composing this one. I feared it, and the reason is, if I were to just remove these sensor bars, most of you would be offended. Many would leave in disgust and I would likely be dismissed as an extremist because how possibly could these be true? How possibly could these be true? Mind you, I remember questioning my own sanity when I started to understand that these were in fact true. I thought, no, that's impossible. But, but, after studying and excelling in all things math, science, logic, and reason for decades, I know how to identify truths when I see them, especially in regards to the topic of circumcision. I didn't come here to debate this issue, I came here to dominate it. <laughs> ah, yeah! <laughs> now, where to begin? So many options. Let's just get on the same page with basic terms in anatomy. So here we have a picture of a circumcised and an uncircumcised emoji, I mean penis. <laughs> Sorry. And, and so, w what are the differences between these two types of penises? Right, the, the foreskin, the part of the penis that extends over the glands. Some people call it an elephant trunk or an anteater nose. We have the circumcised penis, German army helmet, whatever you want to call it. We have many euphemisms. So, I like to ask this question to get a sense of where the room's coming from, because we all want to do what's best for our children, right? So, could I get a show of hands? Who here? if you were to have a son, would have him circumcised for health, hygiene, or cultural or religious reasons. And do you mind if I ask what the most compelling reason is? Because it's normal. Because it's normal? Okay. Anyone else? Show of hands. Yes? What was that? The way it looks. Aesthetics. Okay. <laughs> I assume there are other reasons, but those are a good one. Um, and similarly, uh, show of hands, who, anyone here, if they were to have a daughter, would have her circumcised for health, hygiene, or cultural or religious reasons? Show of hands? Nobody? Everyone's like glaring at me. <laughs> no need to get all shirty. I'm not drawing a false equivalency here. I'm just getting a sense of where the room's coming from. See, I'll tell you where I'm coming from, which led me to the realization of censored fact number one, which opened the Pandora's box to all five of these. Now, my story begins where I imagine many interesting stories begin, with my first encounter with an uncircumcised penis. Into the rabbit hole we go. <laughs> now, uh, any rugby players in here? 
Oh, I even played rugby with someone. Okay, a lone rugby player, yes. Well, I was a rugby player in college. It was a big part of my undergraduate experience. And part of that experience was a legendary rugby tour to Scotland. I remember seeing my first uncircumcised penis and thinking, what is that thing? Now, this piqued my curiosity and prompted, let's call it an investigation on the interwebs on the topic. Now, how do you do research on the internet? You Google your opinion and reinforce it, right? <laughs> now, now, that's called an echo chamber. And as comforting as they may be, I do not do that. Now, despite your incredulity, I'm an actual physicist. Weird, right? I know how to do research. And so when I first Googled circumcision in 2012, the conversation has changed in six years. I know, because I've been paying attention. But six years ago, the general consensus was, between all news sources, ABC, NBC, Time, New York Times, Washington Post, Scientific American, and so on, was that circumcision was cleaner, healthier, prevented STDs and HIV, and was endorsed by the Scientific Academy, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now, this sounded great. It created a coherent narrative in my mind. If circumcision was good for you, then of course I and all my friends were circumcised, obviously. However, however, I stumbled across a website that aggregated quotes about circumcision throughout all time, and something struck me about the Jewish ones. Let me show you, see if you can strike a pattern. Circumcision is a symbol of two things necessary to our well-being. The excision of sexual pleasure and to check a man's pride. 30 AD. The bodily pain is the real purpose of circumcision. One of the reasons is to bring about a decrease in sexual intercourse and a weakening of the organ. The fact that circumcision reduces sexual pleasure is undeniable. 1180 AD. Okay, well, these are ancient history. The foreskin represents man's worst animal-like urges. I like my animal-like urges. <laughs> Impairment of sexual sensation is a special virtue of circumcision. 1985, not too long before I was born. Now, these quotes didn't quite sync with the mainstream narrative. Was circumcision good for me, or did it damage my sexuality? So I did what anybody should do if they're trying to learn about a topic, or any topic. I logged off the internet and I bought books. I bought books about the topic. And something crazy happened when I read books about the topic. I understood it. I understood it. Isn't it crazy how books work that way? And what was even crazier that I understood was how insanely important and relevant the information contained inside these books was to everybody, how incredibly simple it was to understand and how nobody knew it! Nobody knew it! So I did something diabolical. I did something diabolical. I learned everything about circumcision. I know everything about it, and I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so, the story begins 12,000 years ago. Sigmund Freud surmised that circumcision started as a step down from child sacrifice. So instead of sacrificing the child, you would just sacrifice an essential part of him, his genitals. Now these genital blood sacrifices eventually lessened until just parts of his genitals were sacrificed, his foreskin. Now, many people erroneously believe, <laughs> if you can believe it, many people erroneously believe something, but many people erroneously believe that circumcision started in the Old Testament, the Jewish holy book. Actually, Judaism adopted circumcision from tribes circumcising in the area. But if we take a look at the Holy Covenant in Genesis, we can see what it has to say. Every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Whether born or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. Any uncircumcised male will be cut off from his people. Now, a couple things to notice here. Every baby must be circumcised, and slaves too, because that was cool at the time. And if you weren't, and if you weren't, you were cut off from your people, which was tantamount to a death sentence in ancient times. Now, Leonard Glick, who is a Jewish man with a medical degree and a PhD in cultural anthropology with a specialty in genital cutting, 
assures me that this is not even the original covenant. It was appended to the Bible in 500 BC for two reasons. Now the first reason is, the child is circumcised when he is a baby, so he has absolutely no choice in the matter. This forever forces him to look Jewish. Now this promotes tribal cohesiveness, a primary objective of all tribal leaders, as they have a vested interest to maintain the social order of the tribe as they enjoy their status at the top of it. Now, the second we reason is a little more interesting and plays to the underlying psychology behind genital cutting cultures. But let's use a modern day example, fraternity hazing. Um, who here thinks that hazing is just a malicious exercise of power? A fair number. See, that's not exactly correct. See, hazing is an effective strategy if you want your fraternity to survive. See, hazing plays to an underlying psychological mechanism that enables group survival. See, what we do as humans is, we ascribe value to the pain or suffering we endure as the price we pay to join a group or tribe. See, if you were just let into the fraternity, you could easily think, nah, and leave. However, however, after paying a great price in blood, sweat, tears, and body parts, you know it must be valuable. See, Judaic circumcision operates under that same psychological principle. See, ancient Judea was, and still is to a certain extent, an intensely patriarchal society. Male blood represented salvation, female blood represented filth, men ran everything. And nothing was more important to a man than his patriarchal lineage. And nothing represented his patriarchal lineage more than his son. Or even more specifically, his son's penis. So, to be accepted into this fraternity, the Jewish Brotherhood, fathers, likely younger than you, and far less educated since this was thousands of years ago, were literally hazed into cutting off parts of their son's penis. You think college hazing is a problem? Circumcision is the most extreme form of hazing on the planet. And if you didn't do it, you were cut off from your people which was effectively a death sentence. Ah, yeah, we're, we're going there. <laughs> now, Leonard Glick does a great job of summarizing circumcision in ancient Judea in his book. He says, in summary, the father offers his son's foreskin as a bloody sacrifice for what may have been a substitute for child sacrifice. <laughs> um, he acknowledges for what may have been a, he declares acknowledgement of paternity, readiness to submit the child to a perilous procedure, a vowel of sexual restraint of his own and his son in the future, and um, intention to raise him as a conforming member of the male-centered collective, and in summary, offers his submission to the elder's will. Whoa. Do you understand what this means? See, contrary to the popular narrative, circumcision was designed to mark us like cattle. Circumcision was designed to emasculate us like slaves. Circumcision was designed to damage us like we're not even human. That is what circumcision was designed to do. And all this talk about circumcision is not even the circumcision you'd recognize today. See, Judaism underwent an overhaul around 200 AD during a diasporic period. It was called the rabbinic period, as rabbis redid everything to accommodate the needs of a more dispersed population. Now, when rabbis were redoing everything, they redid, you guessed it, the covenant of circumcision as well. See, around 200 AD, Jews didn't want to be circumcised back then either. So, what they would do is they would take their remnant foreskin and stretch it over the head of their penis, and over a period of time, they would look uncircumcised like a Gentile. Now, this allowed Jews of ancient Greece to better fit in with their Gentile peers, as many social events were done in the nude, whether they be public spas or athletic events or whatnot. Now, undoing the holy covenant was anathema to rabbinic authority. So rabbis took revenge. Rabbis took revenge. And to take their revenge, they radicalized the circumcision ritual, from just cutting off the overhanging tip of the foreskin to ablation of the entire tissue. So the new circumcision ritual, the one that stands to this day, goes like this. And it's called the bris malah, which means the covenant of cutting. Sounds like a lovely thing to take your child to. Now, the first stage, which used to be the only stage, is called the milah, which means cutting. 
And here, the ritual circumciser named the moil will amputate the part of the foreskin that extends over the glands. If we take a look at this picture, that first dotted line is the original mila cut. And if we take a look at this picture, here's a moil cutting into the flesh of a newborn's genitals. Now the second stage, which was enacted as an act of rabbinic revenge, is called pariah, which means tearing. And here, the ritual circumciser will sharpen his fingernails and shred the infant's genital mucosa. If one shred of genital mucosa remained, it was deemed religiously invalid. And if we take a look at this picture, here we can see the modern-day pariah cut, where the American medical circumcision is modeled after. As we can see, it's about an amputation of a half to a third of the external genitalia. And here we can see a moil using his sharpened fingernails to shred this infant's genital mucosa. Now this baby doesn't look like he's having a very good time, but I could be wrong. Now the third stage, <laughs> the third stage, and I'm not making this up, you can read it in the ancient rabbinic text, the Mishnah, which is still followed to this day, is called mitzitza, which means sucking. And here, the ritual circumciser, after he shreds the infant's genitals with his fingernails, will take the baby's red, raw, and bleeding penis and put it in his mouth and suck on it. Now this is a modern-day picture of a moil performing mitzitza on this baby. Now, if these seem like extreme acts of sexual violence to you, that is because they are, and they have real consequences. Here we have a baby who has contracted herpes after a moil has performed mitzitza on him. Now this baby is effectively brain dead for the rest of his life because this moil was satisfying an ancient act of rabbinic revenge. This article is from 2017, guys. This is not ancient history. It happens today. Now to be fair, to be fair, Mitzitza was largely abandoned in the 1840s because an influential German rabbi said, you know what guys? After we shred our infant's genitals with our fingernails, maybe we shouldn't suck on the bleeding penis afterwards. <laughs> Good idea, Moses Sefer. Good idea. Now this objective brutality is widely understood within the Jewish community itself, but most tribal members lack the testicular fortitude to stand up to our tribe. I actually got a um, text from a good Jewish friend of mine not long ago. He was attending a bris malah in New York City, and this was our conversation. The whole thing is so, so uncomfortable. The noise is the worst part. A lot of religious stuff, a lot of weird talk, very cultish, very uncomfortable. I mean, the father just looked at me and goes, yeah, it's barbaric. I mean, obviously, guys, obviously it's barbaric. It's called the Covenant of Cutting. It was designed to be barbaric. Now to wrap up this Judaic tangent, although we'll come back, it's important to understand that Jews were largely discriminated and ostracized against throughout all history, not exclusively, but largely because of their Covenant of Cutting. Largely because everyone and their mother knew that these were radical acts of sexual violence. And the thinking went, although it's untrue, it's not completely unreasonable, that if these people were doing this to their own children, could you imagine what they're doing to non-Jewish children? Now, there is no evidence that suggests that this largely minority group that was often persecuted throughout history was brazen enough to kidnap non-Jewish children, but that didn't stop Gentiles from believing that they did. And that inspired prevailing myths um, called the blood libel, which was a prevailing myth among Gentiles that, Christians would circum that Jews would kidnap Christian children and circumcise and murder them. And now here we have a picture of one of these derogatory images. It was called the Murder of Trent, inspired many pogroms. Now note the emphasis on the circumcision. And that is because throughout almost all of Judeo-Christian history, Judaism was associated exclusively with circumcision. And that is because compared to all of the other religious rituals, that one, by far is, that one was by far the most extreme by orders of magnitude. Now, to wrap up censored fact number one, although it'll come back, it is irrefutably true that rabbis designed and implemented circumcision to damage Jewish children's sexuality. Now this is a fact. It is an irrefutable fact. There are tombs of evidence to support this. Yes, it was done to mark us like cattle and to emasculate us like slaves and as an act of submission to your father, but 
to damage our sexuality in the most fundamental of ways for life was also a primary objective. Now this justification is defended to this day by Orthodox rabbis. And remember, throughout all history, all rabbis were what we would consider Orthodox today. See what I mean about censored facts? I can't just come out and say them. I need to explain them. Brittany reminds me all the time. Now moving on to censored fact number two. This one is a little less controversial and it's becoming even more widely known today. Even College Humor did a video about it. And quite honestly, they did a phenomenal job. I'm gonna play the first three minutes. Let's go back in time to the day you were circumcised. God, no. By the time your tip got snipped, circumcision had been a tradition for generations. Would you like to circumcise Brian? Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, his should look like mine, right? Okie doke. No! But the source of that tradition is real weird. His should look like mine, right? His should look like mine, right? Yep, better cut him. I reckon it'll stop him from masturbating. What? Yep. Though religious circumcision's been practiced in the Middle East for millennia, no one did it in the West until the sex-phobic days of the late 19th century, when puritanical doctors promoted it as a way to stop your kids from committing their favorite sin. Observe the vile masturbator, the sallow complexion, the rotten teeth, and the open sores. Actually, I think I have syphilis. Syphilis caused by masturbation. One prominent advocate of dick docking was, and I'm not making this up, John Harvey Kellogg, the inventor of cornflakes. My cure is twofold. A diet rich in flaked corn. Ugh. And cutting off part of the penis. Uh. Victorian prudes like Kellogg just straight up hated sex and thought that by pruning your Peter, they could make it less pleasurable, taming your base, lustful instincts. And, uh... You don't even want to know what they thought you should do to women. Just apply a little carbolic acid to the clitoris. Yikes! Thank God that one didn't catch on. All right, everyone, let's take a five. This is stupid. Being circumcised doesn't stop me from masturbating. Yeah, I know. That's why it's so weird we still do it. But isn't it cleaner or something? No. Maybe in biblical times it helped prevent infection, but nowadays you can just wash your dingus. Circumcision has been found to somewhat reduce the risk of HIV transmission, but so do condoms, and they don't require you to uh, chop your dick off. Okay, but foreskins are useless. Actually, Brian, the foreskin plays an important role in sex. It's a natural lubricant, contains millions of nerve endings, and it protects the glands from being desensitized. Thanks, Bert. Got it, bud. So, I guess the billion dollar question is, how did we go from a Jewish blood sacrifice to a Gentile medical procedure? Seems like a stretch, right? <laughs> so, as college humor was actually spot on. See, 19th century doctors actually believed that sexual pleasure, especially masturbation, was not only evil, but the root of all physical and mental illness. And it was always well known that the foreskin was highly erogenous and facilitated masturbation, so the only reasonable course of action was to forcibly circumcise children. Now, if we take a look at the medical literature in the 19th century, here we can see a treatise on venereal diseases of the sexual system. <laughs> now again, College Humor, spot on, one of the primary advocates of dick docking <laughs> was Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, the inventor of cornflakes. Surreal, isn't it? Now, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg wrote a widely read book in the 19th century titled Treatment for Self-Abuse, also known as Masturbation, and Its Effects. And in this book, he advocated using carbolic acid to burn the clitoris, chaining kids to chastity cages, and tying them up so they couldn't touch their genitals. He also advocated circumcision in small boys, and that it should be performed without anesthesia, so the child forever associates sexual pleasure with pain. Do you understand how sordid that is? Do you understand how sordid that is? To make things even more surreal, Sylvester Graham, the inventor of graham crackers, also advocated circumcision to prevent masturbation, <laughs> claiming a masturbator becomes a confirmed and degraded idiot with livid and shriveled countenance and emaciated and dwarfed body covered in running blisters and sores. And if we take a look at the medical literature in the 19th century, we can see what they thought an actual masturbator looked like. 
Now, if we were to take a representative sampling of circumcision advocates throughout the 20th century, almost all are vehemently anti-masturbation. For example, Abraham Wilburst, who didn't even have the courtesy to invent a snack, claiming, <laughs> circumcision is an absolute necessity for the continuing welfare of the human race. Sound like religious fanaticism to you? He also advocated the forced sterilization of any adult caught masturbating. Or Alan Gutmaker, the president of Planned Parenthood and the vice president of the American Eugenics Society, because those were hand in hand in the 1940s, claiming routine circumcision does not necessitate handling of the penis. Therefore, masturbation is considered less likely. Parents Magazine, widely read stuff. Or even in the medical literature, Campbell's Urology, a gold standard urological textbook, claiming parents are ready to adopt measures which may avert masturbation. Circumcision is usually advised on these grounds. 1970. Do you know what it means if this type of medical rhetoric was in the medical literature in the 1970s? It means that if you were circumcised in the 90s like I was, it's very possible that our urologists learned that we should be circumcised to keep us from masturbating. Now, these Puritan attitudes are not ancient history. They affect us every single day of our lives. Now, they circumcise for many reasons, and it changes every era, and we're going to get into that. But it is irrefutably true that American circumcisions, American, sorry, American physicians adopt a circumcision to damage our children's sexuality. Again, this is a fact. It is an irrefutable fact. It is unmasked in the medical literature. The sexual revolution did not happen until the 1960s. Up until then, throughout almost all of Judeo-Christian history, sexuality was deemed immoral and must be forcibly tamed. Having fun yet? <laughs> I told you these facts were not kind. Now moving on to censored fact number three. We've been talking a lot about the foreskin. But what is it? I mean, yes, it's the part of the penis that extends over the glands, but really, what is it? That's a great question. It's a totally foreign body to most American men, and many American women too. So let's take a closer look. Now, I found this analogy helpful over the years. I have terrible vision. I have terrible vision. Now, without my glasses in or my contacts on, I can, I can still orient myself on the stage and mix up my prepositions. But I can still orient myself on the stage and see the general shapes of you. But at the end of the day, I have terrible vision. However, however, once I put my glasses on or my contacts in, I can see the entire room in vivid detail, down to the facial expressions of those of you in the back, with my corrected entire vision. Sounds obvious, right? Well, it wasn't for me. See, growing up, I was decent at sports. I started on every state champ rugby team I played on. My nickname in Pop Warner football was the Water Boy. Presumably because of my middle linebacker skills and not for my perceived autism. But, but there was one notable exception, Little League Baseball. See, to the despair of my Little League team, I managed to bat a zero for two consecutive years. A zero! And they threw the ball pretty slow back then. I had no idea why I was so bad. What I eventually discovered was, the reason I was so bad was I couldn't see the ball. And I didn't know I couldn't see the ball, because no one had told me that I needed corrective lenses. So I just unwittingly assumed that everyone saw the same way I did. It was out of my realm of consciousness that the eye could see with such range, depth, and clarity. Now, the point of the story is, once I realized I had a sensory deficit, I corrected that deficit, and my quality of life improved drastically, along with my batting average. Now, how does this relate to circumcision? <laughs> well, I'm sure most of us have had pretty mundane conversations about eyesight and corrective lenses, but how many of us, you can raise your hands if you'd like, have had in-depth conversations about how much pleasure and where we feel it in our penises? Probably none of us is my guess. You can put your hand down, Brittany. <laughs> but, um, however, 
<laughs> However, in the Journal of British Urology, they did just that. They studied the sensitivity differences between the circumcised and the uncircumcised penis. Now, if we take a look at their findings, with red and purple being the most sensitive, what we can see is the most sensitive part of a circumcised penis, the red, is along the circumcision scar line, the red and purple. Whereas the least sensitive part, uh, fun fact, is the glands, the yellow and green. <coughs> now, if we contrast that with the uncircumcised, or more appropriately named intact penis, what we can see is the most erogenous part of the intact penis is the entirety of the foreskin which is entirely consistent with the historical knowledge that the foreskin was the most erogenous part of the penis, which is exactly why they cut it off. Now, if you contrast that again with the circumcised penis, the most erogenous part of the circumcised penis is the scar of where the foreskin was amputated. Now, when I've spoken with friends who've been circumcised in adulthood, they've said sex without a foreskin is the difference between night and day, the difference between black and white and color which makes sense because most of your nerve endings were in your foreskin. So if, you were circ which makes <laughs> so, if you were circumcised at birth, you were like me before I got glasses. You may unwittingly assume that's what everyone else sees or feels, but you have no idea what your penis is capable of because you've never had the sensory tissue necessary to feel the sensations you're supposed to. Now, this sensory deficit has always been known and praised by circumcision advocates, despite fierce opposition from both inside and outside of religious ideologies. For example, European Dr. C.J. Fallier advances the astute argument in the medical literature, the sensory pleasure induced by the foreskin is lost by circumcision. The fundamental biological act becomes, for the circumcised male, the satisfaction of an urge and not the refined sensory experience it was meant to be. Now, this is a profound loss. This is a profound loss. It is a loss of your humanity, is what it is. Now, the foreskin is responsible for more than just the majority of sexual pleasure a man will experience throughout his lifetime. There are actually essential functions of human sexuality intrinsic to the foreskin, which is why it has evolved to be part of our reproductive organ. Now, these sensitivity diagrams are great, but what is the foreskin? Like, really, what is it? Now, this is a great question. I had no idea for two decades, and medical professionals are by no stretch of the imagination exempt from this blaring gap in medical knowledge. I, I have had to educate prestigious surgeons on basic penile anatomy and function. And the reason for this is most people, physicians included, grew up in the age of mass circumcision in the U.S., meaning, with rates as high as 90%, meaning they never had a foreskin, never, never saw a foreskin growing up, and studied from medical textbooks that omitted the foreskin as if it's not part of the penis. Now, this is truly mind-blowing. I need you to grasp this reality. It is a reality that would make Orwell himself shudder. A human body part. A human body part of great sexual value has been censored out of the public's consciousness. Now, this is a direct result of growing up in a genital-cutting culture such as the United States. Now, reality can often be quite discomforting, and this is a prime example. So let me clear up the misconceptions. The average male foreskin on the adult male is 12 to 15 square inches. The average adult foreskin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the size of the average male foreskin. My now, this foreskin sculpture was created only a few years ago by the brilliant artist Vincenzo Aiello, who is actually joining us here today. It's called Hufo, Human Foreskin, a hyper-realistic art sculpture. Now, if we take a look at how it actually works on an anatomical level, what we can see is the foreskin is composed of four major parts. So we have the outer foreskin, which is just a continuation of the shaft skin, which keeps the glands sensitive throughout life. We have the inner foreskin, similar to the intermucosal tissue of your mouth or the female genitalia. We have the frenulum, which is a highly erogenous tethering structure, which anchors a moving body part, the foreskin, to a non-moving body part, the shaft. And then we have the ridged band, also known as the lips of the foreskin. Because like the lips of the face, the lips of the foreskin provide transition from skin to inner mucosa. And like the lips of the face, 
The lips of the foreskin are densely innervated with approximately 10 to 20,000 fine touch nerve endings, also making this known as the male G-spot. Ever wonder why ribbed condoms exist? They are trying to recreate what every man comes with standard issue. <laughs> the intact penis is far superior at stimulating the female than the circumcised one. Now, damaging female sexuality was also a motivation of the architects of circumcision. As Rabbi Isaac ben Yedea explains, she too will court the man who is uncircumcised in the flesh and lie against his breast with great passion. For he thrusts inside her a long time because of his foreskin, which acts as a barrier against, inter against ejaculation and intercourse. Thus she feels pleasure and reaches an orgasm first. But when a circumcised man desires the beauty of a woman, he will find himself performing his task quickly, emitting his seed as soon as he inserts his crown. As soon as he begins intercourse, he immediately comes to a climax. She has no pleasure from him when she lies down. Bro. Now remember, this was an argument in favor of circumcision. <laughs> because rabbis didn't only want to damage their men's sexuality, but they wanted to make sure that their women weren't sexually fulfilled either. Now, <coughs> Rabbi Yudea's claim is actually supported by recent studies in the medical literature. For example, what we can see is, um, with their circumcised partners, women were more likely not to have a vaginal orgasm. And if we take a look at the actual numbers, percent likelihood of vaginal orgasm, what we can see is circumcised men brought their female partners to orgasm about 35% of the time and intact men 60%. Now those numbers in parentheses are standard deviations and they're quite large because every man uses his penis differently. But if we extrapolate the results of this methodologically sound study, what we can conclude is male circumcision has robbed American women of about half of all of their vaginal orgasms. Now this is a staggering loss for American women. I am sorry that male circumcision has profoundly harmed you in this way as well. Now there's an entire body of scientific literature that shows that amputating large functional part of your sex organ results in a variety of sexual difficulties. Obviously. Here's just another example. Circumcision was associated with frequent orgasm difficulties in men and a range of frequent sexual dif difficulties in women. Now remember, despite our fancy clothes and venues, we are all still animals. And if you damage an animal's reproductive and bonding organ, you will damage how it reproduces and bonds. We've even done rat studies on this. Removal of the penile sheath virtually eliminates penile reflexes and decreases copulatory effectiveness. I don't know who did that study, but... <laughs> <laughs> but removing functional sex organs necessarily leaves you with sexual dysfunction. Now, here's a personal question. Have any of you ever come too soon in intercourse? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's because we've had a big part of our penis that regulates the ejaculatory response <laughs> stolen from us. It's just this wild theory I have. Mission accomplished, Rabbi. <laughs> I realize how this is not immediately obvious, how this butterfly shape is a foreskin. So if we take a look at this composite, what we can see is that the foreskin is a bilayer tissue that wraps around the head of a circumcised penis until we have what we would recognize as an uncircumcised or intact penis. Now, these are just a snapshot of the functions of the foreskin. I have actually compiled a comprehensive list if you can believe. And I have broken them down into sexual, protective, and other functions. Now look how massive the average male foreskin is. Look how massive it is. <laughs> but seriously, but seriously, could you imagine saying that this massive part of the penis with 20 compelling sexual functions is unimportant? It is massively important. It is massively important. And everybody knew it was important. That is why they removed it. So, if you were circumcised at birth, you were condemned to a life of a devastating sensory deficit as you lose most of your nerve endings, including your male G-spot. But it gets worse. See, once this tissue is removed, your penis undergoes a process called keratinization, where the protein keratin, the same protein that makes up your hair, 
in nails in rhinoceros horns covers the remaining minority of sensory tissue on the penis. So if we take a look at an intact penis, what we can see is the glands are soft, sensitive, kept that way by the protective foreskin retracted in this picture. Where if we contrast that with a circumcised penis, not only is it missing most of its sensory tissue because the foreskin is removed, but the remaining minority is covered in this protein callus, which even further desensitizes sex. Circumcision removes almost the entirety of sexual experience for men. It is a profoundly evil thing to do to a human being. Now, just as you can never fully appreciate a kiss if you have your lips amputated, so too can you never fully appreciate the essential human experience of making love if you have your foreskin amputated. Now, this is a profound loss. This is a loss of your humanity. It changes your worldview. And that is why I'm so passionate about this issue, because it is a radical violation of an individual's fundamental human rights. Now, there are also a slew of other sexual dysfunctions that result from removing a massively functional part of your penis. One of the more compelling ones is the loss of all the penis's natural mobility and lubrication, which has resulted in ubiquitous sexual disability, which we have internalized as a genital cutting culture and accepted as normal. See, the reason that many circumcised men rely on personal lubricant to masturbate is an imposed sexual disability. Necessary for us, you know. Most European men have no idea that you need lotion to masturbate. Considering we evolved in the wild, the very notion that you need to go to CVS and buy a synthetic <laughs> lubricant to masturbate is ludicrous. It is lunacy. Yet we have internalized this sexual disability in our culture. Now, there have been multi-hundred million dollar industries that have risen to address just this one sexual disability in our culture. Namely, the personal lubricant market. Pain, pain during intercourse is also a big problem for women in this country. And if you take a look at the articles, it's all, oh, what's wrong with the woman? What's wrong with me? No, there is nothing wrong with women in this country. See, women are engaging in intercourse with men who do not have the penises they are supposed to have. See, women are meant to be stimulated by the non-abrasive pressure of the male's erectile bodies sliding in and out of the foreskin. Think of a motion of putting your fingers on your cheeks and going like this. They are not meant to be stimulated by the friction of an immobile, unlubricated, circumcised penis, which has never and will never exist in nature. Think of a shaping motion like this. Very different from this. You can try yourself if you like. Now, removing this tissue permanently and drastically alters the mechanics of intercourse, which can manifest itself in sexual pain and or dysfunction for both partners, the effects of which are increasingly pronounced as the circumcised male ages. Now, I can't believe I have to say this. This is absurd. But to remove a massive amount of form from the penis and expect not to affect its function is insane. It is naive and it exhibits fundamental misunderstandings of both Biology 101 and the history of circumcision. 99% of which was an outspoken attempt to control and repress male sexuality. Only in the US, only in the US is it done for medical reasons. And only in the US are there multiple multi-billion dollar industries they rely on the continuation of circumcision to continue to rake in their profits off of the backs of our children's sexual futures. Which will bring me to censored fact number four, also known as the medical malfeasance behind the circumcision industry. But to wrap up censored fact number three, removing this body part is damaging. It is obviously damaging. Circumcision was designed to damage you, and that is exactly what it does. Circumcision significantly damages you for life. The foreskin is important. Yes, these three facts are true. There is no ambiguity whatsoever. But you may be asking yourself, if these three facts are true, which they are, how does a supposedly scientific authority like the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend circumcision? Well, I can't just tell you. It's too radical. But I can show you. I can show you how they did it, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. 
Now, remember when I said all these mainstream sources recommend circumcision? Well, what they're actually doing is they're deferring to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now, what the American Academy of Pediatrics did is they wrote a circumcision recommendation in 2012. It was a one-page policy statement supported by a 22-page epidemiological technical report, which, by chance, I happen to have here with me. <laughs> now, this may seem daunting to most of the public, the American public, which is largely scientifically illiterate. Well, I am not just scientifically literate, I am scientifically dominant and modest. I started working under senior faculty here at Harvard when I was 18 years old on a graduate-level textbook on the thermodynamics of energy consumption and climate change. I wrote my college thesis on quantum tunneling. I'm not kidding. Here it is. <laughs> this report, this report right here, is child's play to me. And I will tell you exactly what it has to say. Now, the summary is, the health benefits of circumcision outweigh the risks. And what are those benefits? They include prevention of urinary tract infections, penile cancer, and transmission of some sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. Now, I'm a pretty hardcore nerd, and I like to write things in equations, and it's very easy to write this recommendation in an equation. So we can say the benefits outweigh the risks. Now, notice implicit in their frame, there can be no negatives to circumcision, because we know the foreskin isn't important, right? Now, we, let's quickly dissect this. We can write the benefits as UTIs, penile cancer, and STIs and HIV. So urinary tract infections. Just to be clear, women are 10 to 50 times more likely to get a UTI. And we never suggest amputating parts of their bodies. And if we were to take the AAP's numbers at face value, which we shouldn't, it takes 100 circumcisions to prevent one UTI. At 20 compelling sexual functions per foreskin, you need to remove 2,000 sexual functions from men to prevent one nothing infection that's easily treated by antibiotic. That's insane. They're just grasping at straws. It is inconsequential is what it is. Penile cancer. Sounds scary, right? Well, it's one of the rarest types of cancer on the planet. And according to the AAP, it takes anywhere between 922 and 322,000 circumcisions to prevent one case of penile cancer. Do you know what that discrepancy means? Between 1,000 and 322,000? It means they have no idea. They have no idea how many circumcisions it takes to prevent one case of penile cancer. This is because it is so absurdly rare, the data doesn't exist. Besides, besides, it only exclusively affects elderly men, which makes this completely irrelevant, completely irrelevant to neonatal circumcision. The case that it prevents is STIs. Okay, well, just to be clear, almost all of the literature is a confusion between causation and correlation because genital cutting cultures do not simply map onto non-genital cutting cultures. But even if they did, even if they did, the U.S. has both the highest rate of sexually active circumcised males and the highest rate of STDs and HIV in the developed world. Now, the nuance here is, this doesn't necessarily mean that circumcision doesn't prevent the spread of STDs, but it certainly suggests it promotes the spread of STDs, and there are sound immunological reasons for this, namely by drastically altering the mechanics of intercourse, which causes pain and bleeding, which opens pores for pathogens to exchange between partners, but it does unequivocally prove that circumcision is not a primary STD deterrent. To claim otherwise is a claim of lunacy. It really is. Now, the claim that it prevents HIV. Well, HIV is scary, so let's take a closer look. <laughs> now, throughout all history, circumcision advocates have claimed that circumcision prevents the scariest disease of the era, whether it be masturbation, syphilis and gonorrhea, cancer, now HIV. Surprise! <laughs> now who here, who here has heard the popular claim in the media that circumcision prevents your chance of contracting HIV by 60%? Wow, okay, most of you it seems. Well, we're going to take a closer look at the numbers is what we're going to do, because I'm a scientist. 
So if we take a look at the three randomized controlled trials that the media often cites, what they actually found, if you aggregate the results, is 2.5% of intact men got HIV and 1.2% of circumcised men. That is a 1.3% difference. Much smaller than 60%, wouldn't you say? So how did they get to 60%? Well, what it was, it was a relative risk reduction. And that 1.2% is about 60% less than 2.5%. Now, if you take a look at the studies, which I did, which I'm eminently qualified to assess, you see this list of blaring methodological errors, which are cumulative. Any one of them could easily account for the 1.3% difference. If we take a look at just one, they taught the circumcised group how to use condoms. <laughs> Seems like a pretty relevant difference to me. <laughs> now, to use two very small, very poorly measured numbers and report their relative risk reduction as a factual rate of reduction is not just disingenuous, it is dishonest. The claim that circumcision prevents HIV is no truer than the claim that it prevents masturbation. It is a lie. And this is an erroneous claim. Now, if we sum up the left sides of the equation, we have inconsequential, irrelevant, and erroneous benefits outweigh the risks of the procedure. And what are the risks of the procedure? Well, according to the AAP, they tell us not once, but twice that the true incidence of complications after newborn circumcision is unknown. They have no idea. And then, just to hammer the point, they say, and I quote, it is difficult, if not impossible, to assess the impact of complications because the data doesn't exist. The data doesn't exist. Did you know? Did you know? There is no legal requirement for circumcisers to report complications in this country. Which brings us to the new equation after doing the math. We have these vaguely defined, highly dubious benefits outweigh the unknown risks of a prophylactic amputation of a body part. And do you know how many times in this scientific document they mention the functions of the body part? Zero! Zero! Not once do they mention the functions of the foreskin. Implicit in their frame, it is completely useless. I just spent an hour describing how important the foreskin is. The foreskin is massively important, and everybody knew that is why they removed it. Whew. I'm going to get all worked up again soon, but you can tell me. Calm down, Cropper. But do you know how they have the audacity to make such an omission? Do you? Well, they say, and I quote, the literature review does not support the belief that male circumcision adversely affects sexual function or sensitivity or sexual satisfaction, regardless of how those factors are defined. Regardless? Do you understand how broad of a statement that is? Who knew that amputating a large part of your sex organ affected sexual function? Oh, that's right. Literally everybody throughout all of history. That's why they did it. That's why they did it. Did they forget censored facts one and two? that both rabbis and physicians circumcise children to damage their sexuality in the most fundamental of ways for life? Now, it's very telling if we take a look at their literature review. <laughs> they reviewed 1,028 articles. That is a big number just to make it look like they did a lot of work. Do you know how many focus on sexual satisfaction? Just one! Just one! Remember this study? And they ignored its conclusion that the foreskin is the most erogenous part of the penis. And do you know what they had to say about all the overwhelming, irrefutable evidence that demonstrates just how important the foreskin is? They say, and I quote, they failed to provide evidence that the circumcised penis has decreased sensitivity compared with the uncircumcised penis. And do you know what they based that statement on? Nothing! <laughs> Nothing! They just say all the overwhelming evidence to the contrary? We're not going to include it. Now, <laughs> you might be thinking to yourself, wow, Clopper, everything you say is logically sound and consistent, and I think I agree. That's good. That means you're thinking now. You're doing something they don't want you to do. Now, just so you don't think I'm some fringe activist up here, what I am telling you is the prevailing worldview. 
If we take a look at what the rest of the world has to say, I mean, only in the US and Israel do they think it is a good idea to cut into the flesh of newborn children. See, the Royal Dutch Medical Association says, circumcision is a violation of the child's right and can and does cause complications. Or the German Pediatric Association, there is no medical reason to circumcise a boy before he can give consent. And virtually all other pediatric societies worldwide hold the AAP's views as nonsense. Or Australia and New Zealand claiming the AAP technical report on circumcision is epidemiologically incompetent and an embarrassment to the AAP. Yeah. Boo, AAP. Entire consortiums of doctors, epidemiologists, urologists, and pediatricians have said only one argument put forth by the AAP has some theoretical relevance, namely the possible protection against UTIs. Can you imagine saying, oh, uh, one in a hundred chance of contracting a UTI or my male G-spot. Um, it's not even on a scale. It's an absurd statement. It's an absurd statement is what it is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a scientific document. It is an obfuscating lie. And there are bad guys to this story. There are bad guys. And I did not let them get away. Do not worry. And they are the masterminds behind this lie. Now, it's very telling if we listen to what they have to say. Now, Andrew Friedman is a Jewish urologist, which there are many. But you would imagine, if he's on this prestigious medical committee, he'd be able to separate his religious beliefs from his scientific medical opinion. Unless he tells us he can. And he says, and I quote, I circumcised my son for religious reasons. I did it because I had 3,000 years of ancestors looking over my shoulder. Sounds like a conflict of interest to me. <laughs> and then, just to clarify, on camera he says, and I quote, in my practice, I like to sort of define it as a tribal custom. And if you belong to a tribe that does it, then you really want it. Well, I've got news for you, Andy. <laughs> you are not a tribal practitioner. You are not a witch doctor. You are a medical doctor, or at least you're supposed to be. Now, here's my theory on this. Here's my theory on this. Because this is false. They are, is, they are objectively lying to us. My theory is this. That if the American Academy of Pediatrics got eight borderline competent physicians in a room with understanding of basic penile anatomy and function, they would write a report like every other pediatric society on the world about neonatal circumcision, which is, it is medically unnecessary, it violates your fundamental human rights, and it damages your sexuality for life. Now, if the AAP were to write this report, if the AAP were to write this report, as a society, we would begin to understand that amputating large functional parts of your child's reproductive organ is a bad idea. I can't believe I have to be up here saying this. Now, if we were to understand this as a society, if we were to understand this as a society, we wouldn't allow anyone to circumcise any child under any pretense, including fulfilling ancient acts of rabbinic revenge, meaning the Holy Covenant would die, as it must, as it should have thousands of years ago. Could you imagine, could you imagine, if this group of doctors got together and said, you know what, it's okay to circumcise females because of religious ideologies. Oh wait, what was that Douglas de Kimo? In 2010, you published on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics a recommendation in favor of female circumcision, titled Ritual Genital Cutting of Female Minors? Of course you did! Of course you did! Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? <laughs> and his reasoning was, well, we respect the legitimacy of this tribal tradition. How could we not respect the legitimacy of this one? At least he's a logically consistent monster. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, here we have a group of physicians who have actively deceived us 
who are recommending an amputation on a child's sex organ that is both heinously violent and sexually damaging for life. How dare they? Now, I wanted to get into the history of circumcision advocacy throughout the U.S. and how almost all major proponents are Jewish. Now, mind you, I'm not proposing this is some type of Jewish conspiracy, but it certainly isn't a coincidence either. See, Harvard's preeminent historian of science, Stephen Jay Gould, describes this phenomenon aptly in his book, The Mismeasure of Man. How throughout all history, scientists have been completely blind to their own flawed frames of references, implicitly accepting them as truth. See, when you grow up in a genital-cutting culture, such as Judaism, you implicitly believe that the foreskin is dirty or terrible or dangerous. And you see that type of religious fanaticism reflected through almost all major circumcision advocates, which is a clear demonstration as to just how toxic genital cutting cultures are. Genital cutting cultures are toxic by definition. And as history has shown, they're contagious as well. Well, I've got news for any detractors out there. There is nothing anti-Semitic or discriminatory about being opposed to this tribal custom. This is baseline human decency. Now, Stephen Jay Gould puts it aptly in his book. We pass through this world but once. Few tragedies can be more extensive than the stunting of life. That is what we have here, ladies and gentlemen. They are sexually stunting this child for life. It is a tragedy. And it is happening thousands of times every day in our hospitals because this duplicitous group of physicians have lied to our faces. This is an unforgivable crime. Make no mistake, they hide. They hide behind their degrees. They hide behind their symbols of authority. But these authorities, these authorities who recommend circumcision, they're composed of people, people like you and me. But the difference with me is, the difference with me is, I hide behind nothing. No, I remember, I remember, when I graduated from university, summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa in physics, when I was poised to get my PhD in virtually any discipline from any institution on this planet, I instead, I instead, started studying circumcision full time. <laughs> Parents were thrilled. <laughs> and I remember feeling like I was losing my mind because the entire narrative was controlled by sexually violent ideologues like those on the board. Well, not anymore. Now, what we have here is, wrapping this whole thing together, is we have a history of a small group of powerful and well-placed sexually violent ideologues, or ideological fanatics, who, despite global condemnation, have censored the functions of the foreskin by creating a nonsensical recommendation, which they have turned into an obfuscating lie, which they then peddle to a complicit and strangely ideologically homogenous US media, who I'm sure is gonna love me, who disseminates widespread information, creating this vicious fraudulent US echo chamber. It's all a lie. It's all a lie, guys. 100% of it is a lie. Circumcision is a disgusting lie. Why? Why would they do such a thing? I don't know. I have a few ideas. Maybe, maybe because they have damaged in the most sexually violent and fundamental of ways for life over 120 million men in this country. Do you understand the medical liability on that? It is in the trillions and trillions of dollars. Or maybe, maybe, because they have raped American men of over one trillion erogenous nerve endings. Do you understand the pleasure potential that has been lost? And what's it replaced with? It's replaced with rage. And that rage is embedded in our culture. Don't you see it? I do. Well, maybe, maybe it's to defend religious ideologies. Because that'd be a good idea. Because, oh man, 
Oh man, would we look foolish? Would we look foolish if we were performing blood sacrifices in the 21st century? That would make us like a genital mutilation cult. But there's no way. There's no way we have genital mutilation cults in the 21st century, is there? Or you can't criticize them because we know they're retaliate. There's no universe where that could be a reality. Or maybe, maybe, it's all for the money. Maybe it's all for the money. You realize they make billions, would they be billions of dollars a year harvesting our children's genitals? Harvesting my genitals, harvesting your genitals. It's the most evil thing I've ever heard. I could come up with something so evil if I tried. This may be theatrical, but it's legitimately evil. And it will not rest until these industries are wiped off the face of the planet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a scientific document. It is a piece of government propaganda authored by a small group of powerful and well-placed sexually violent ideologues who have written this to conceal the truth that the American medical complex has damaged our sexuality for life, violated our fundamental human rights, and harvested our genitals for profit. It is all a lie. Now, Censored fact number four. Oh, censored fact number four. I love Rick. The complicit US media continues to force feed us the American Academy of Pediatric Circumcision recommendation, which is a blatant lie, unapologetically motivated by religious ideologies. Which ideologies? I don't know. Maybe the ones designed to damage you in the most fundamental of ways for life. Is creating a clear picture for you as to what this ideology has done to this country? Now moving on to censored fact number five. Because you know, I need to strip the US of any remnants of moral authority it may claim to have. Let's summarize what we've learned, shall we? <clears throat> now, I never touched on this argument earlier because it's insane, but circumcision advocates claim it's cleaner. Let me be clear. There's nothing intrinsically dirty about your penis or your vulva or your foreskin or your labia. You, nor your sexuality, nor your genitals are dirty. Your genitals are clean if you clean them. <laughs> we are still shedding the vile Puritan beliefs that this country was founded on. We've been raised to believe that these radically abnormal and unhealthy sexual attitudes are in any way normal or acceptable. They are not. And then in this country, we have gross ignorance of normal unaltered genital anatomy, even among doctors and especially among doctors. The fact that doctors still circumcise today is a testament to their ignorance. And then in this country, we have delusions of normality supported by cultural terminology. Remember this picture? We were never called a woman uncircumcised, so too is a man not uncircumcised. This is just what the man comes with. It's a normal penis. See, what we are doing as a genital cutting culture is we are normalizing our abnormal penises that are missing both form and function while simultaneously making normal men feel insecure about themselves. It's insane. It's legitimately bonkers. And then, in this country, we place religious blood rights, R-I-T-E-S, over fundamental human rights. And that's clear in all our government documents. We respect religious rights because I respect human rights. And I know, I know from speaking to so many of us from our generation that we, we find this disgusting. This is a culty genital blood sacrifice. And that is not even a derogatory description. It is an accurate one. And what history has taught us is if we tolerate this, it is only one step away before we tolerate genital harvesting. And that is exactly what we found. It's promoted on irrelevant to erroneous medical claims. It is performed without consent or anesthesia, despite overwhelming evidence of irreparable physical, sexual, and psychological harm. It precludes the possibility of ever having a natural sexual experience. That is a profound loss. That is a profound loss. And for what? 
so the current generation of circumcised adults doesn't have to face the very unwelcome reality that we have been deprived of an essential human experience? Should we deprive our children of that too, to maintain this lie? Do you understand how dehumanizing this is? Did you know, did you know that the entire civilized world looks upon us with disgust? And they should, they really should. I've been to many countries and they cannot believe that we perform these hideous sex crimes on our children. And then people, people actually believe that it was good for them, that having a big part of your penis cut off with a scar to show for it was good for their sex life. We bought the lie, we bought that disgusting lie, hook, line, and sinker. And then the worst part of it all, is it compels you. It compels you to circumcise your child the same way you were circumcised. There's no such thing as sons wanting to look like their fathers. It's fathers want their sons to look like them. Otherwise, they will be consistently reminded of the parts of their humanity that were stolen from them when they see their child's entire genitalia. That is the darker psychological mechanism behind the I want him to look like me trope. And then there's the taboo. The taboo, which I'm clearly oblivious to. Do you know how many times, do you know how many times I've been called the foreskin guy? They don't call me the eye guy because I don't believe in gouging children's eyes out, or the clit guy because I don't believe in clitoractomizing baby girls. So too am I not the foreskin guy because I don't believe in raping our children of their birthright. Amputating the foreskin is no less arbitrary or vicious than amputating any other part of his body. In fact, in fact, it is arguably way more heinous because it is part of his genitals. And then it was designed. It was designed. So the child forever associates sexual pleasure with pain. Circumcision is evil, guys. It really is. And as humans, we are not very good at coming to terms with the fact that we have perpetuated evil or that evil was done to us. So we delude ourselves. It's just one big delusion, one big defense mechanism, operating on a national and an ideological scale. It is insane. It is level 10 insanity. Please see this. This, this is real sexual trauma. I know. And now that we have this great list of traits, what were we talking about again? Oh, that's right. Literally everything Americans readily recognize about female circumcising cultures. Remember when I said I wasn't drawing a false equivalency earlier? I wasn't! I was drawing a real equivalency. Male and female circumcision are not similar. They are not. They are identical. They are identical. The psychological mechanisms are identical. Gender is not even part of the equation. Now some people would say, how dare you? How dare you compare male and female circumcision? How dare I? How dare I? Do you know how many forms of female circumcision remove more tissue than this? Just in fibrillation, and that is less than 1% of reported cases. Male circumcision in the US is one of the most extreme forms of genital cutting on the planet. Now, now this, this is not a competition of whose human rights are violated more. The point is, both are egregious acts of sexual violence and outrageous violations of human rights. Now, I don't know about you guys, but these pictures look pretty similar to me, right? Like, am I living in an episode of The Twilight Zone? Because it doesn't take a genius to know that this is a massive problem. Why do you think there is a 0% consensual rate? That is because it is a radical, it is a radical violation of human rights. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, Clopper, if this is such a radical violation of human rights, where's the outrage? It's everywhere! People are literally protesting in the streets. They are covering their genitals in blood and screaming bloody murder. And do you know what the craziest part about these people is? Do you know what the craziest part about these people is? It's their right! Isn't that wild? I thought so. 
And if you think there's radical violation of human rights that has a profoundly negative effect on you every single day for the rest of your life until you die is going away anytime soon, no, no. This issue is coming to a head. And it's coming to a head now. I am just one cog in the Enlightenment machine. Countries are beginning to ban the practice. In a few months, the brilliant filmmaker Brennan Moroda is releasing his compelling and irrefutable documentary titled American Circumcision. Let's watch the trailer, shall we? Is this what we want to be doing as parents? Is this what parenting looks like? Whoa. Guys. Guys! Why do I have to be up here? Seriously, why do I have to be up here? Why are you making me be the one who does this? But I refuse. I refuse to be part of a culture where this is remotely acceptable. It is radically unacceptable, is what it is. Now, to summarize censored fact number five, male and female circumcision are not similar. They are not. They are identical. They are identical. You know all the outrage and vitriol we direct at female genital mutilation cultures? That they're outrageously ignorant, barbaric, and sexually violent? Well, hello! that happens here, on the greatest nation on earth. The fact that we condemn FGM cultures as an MGM culture, their hypocrisy is palpable. And the notion that they would listen to us as we stand on no moral ground whatsoever is ludicrous. It is lunacy. These are the five censored facts of our culture. Breathe them in. So moving on to implications of these facts. As you can imagine, none of them are kind. Implication number one for the 120 million circumcised men in this country. Our first sexual experience was that of extreme sexual pain, torture, and mutilation. We will never know the natural sexual experience. Now this is a profound loss. This is a loss of our humanity. It changes your worldview. It is an affront to the miracle of evolution in our shared birthright. There is compelling evidence that it forever damages the maternal infant bond. Many psychologists contend that the extreme sexual pain, torture, and mutilation is encoded deep in our psyches and provides the backdrop for all of our future social and sexual relationships for life. Implication number two, our religious ideologies have failed us the Abrahamic religions. Now, Christianity often gets a bad rap for being sex negative. Some of the more conservative groups even demand abstinence pledges, which leads to what? <laughs> but at least, but at least, Christianity had the good sense to forbid circumcision. Yes, you heard me right, Christianity banned circumcision. In the New Testament, it says, and I quote, if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. That means if you are Christian and you are circumcised, you are in direct violation of your faith. Remember, circumcision was seen as the primary distinction between Jews and Christians throughout almost all of Judeo-Christian history. Now, for that reason, and that reason alone, Christianity gets a pass. Not even Christian. 
Islam, on the other hand, is the largest circumcising group in the world. But it also has over one billion people. And in their holy book, the Quran, there is not a single mention of circumcision. Because this group is so large and diverse, some groups circumcise, some don't. And they are not nearly as relevant to circumcision in the US. I am going to omit them from the conversation. Judaism, though. Judaism, the blood that courses through my veins. The extreme act of sexual violence that is circumcision is not just promoted by this ideology, but it is mandated by it. Extreme acts of sexual violence against defenseless children are pillars of Judaism. And we must shatter these pillars. And we must shatter them immediately. There will be no compromise. And if religious communities do not comply, we will force them to comply. Just as we do with female circumcising cultures. Because they are identical. If they lack the integrity to stand up for their children, we will do it for them. Just as some of the more enlightened Nordic countries are beginning to do. Genital cutting is an evil that plagues the globe. Historians will look back and not be able to believe that we tolerated such radical acts of sexual violence in the name of rabbinic revenge for so long. Now, despite my fervor, <laughs> I'm a reasonable person. I acknowledge, I acknowledge that Jewish parents are trying to damage their sons in a very fundamental way for life, but that is exactly what they're doing. And this ignorance needs to end immediately, lest Judaism continue to embarrass itself on a global scale. Implication number three. Our country has failed us. The United States has failed us. Now, there are anti-FGM laws. They were ratified in 1996. Not too long ago, mind you. There's no anti-MGM law. I wasn't protected. You weren't protected. We weren't treated like human beings in this country. Now, implication number four. Our parents made the wrong choice. I am sorry, parents. You were lied to. I'm not here to shame you. I'm not here to shame anyone, except the AAP. But what they've done is truly monstrous. But it is objectively the wrong choice. It is objectively the wrong choice to cut into the flesh of your newborn child and amputate large functional parts of his reproductive organ. That is objectively the wrong choice. And the fact that that choice even exists is insane. It is level 10 insanity. And the reason that choice exists is because our country has failed us. Because this country values religious blood rights over our fundamental human rights. Because of the influence of this powerful ideology. And as a result, we've all been sexually tortured and raped of our birthright. The magnitude of this crime cannot be overstated. Now, some people choose not to understand. Instead, they point a finger at the messenger. They point a finger at me. They say, Clopper, why are you so angry? Did your dick get botched or something? <laughs> no! Moving forward, what are the solutions? Well, the easiest thing, the easiest thing we can do right now is to not use our diluted terminology. Now, this is not an uncircumcised penis. It is not yet to be circumcised, just like a woman is not yet to be circumcised. It's just a normal or an intact penis. And because we're all adults here, let's use pictures of actual anatomy. So here we can see a picture of an intact penis, and here we can see a picture of a circumcised penis. And here we can see a picture of the circumcision scar line, where this man's foreskin was crushed together and amputated at birth. Now, what are these penises end results of? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Billions of years of evolution. And what is the circumcised penis and end result? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bris Malah. And what was that again? It was the Jewish covenant of cutting that was born in antiquity out of superstition. It was arbitrarily made up with a nonsensical origin as an act of rabbinic revenge. 
where a group of genitally altered men gather around a defenseless child <laughs> while they recite lines from an ancient text glorifying genocide and homicide, where the father abdicates responsibility for the child as he submits to tribal hazing, where the child's own grandfather forces the child's legs apart as the elder of the tribe sharpens his fingernails into claws like an animal and shreds the infant's little penis into a bloody pulp and sucks on the mutilated remains. Is a step away from child sacrifice? Is a satanic ritual? And these moils are rapists, savages, animals. The circumcised penis is the end result of a blood sacrifice from an ancient tribe intending to damage our sexuality. There are no health benefits. It is all a rabbinic lie. So I remember asking myself when I was younger, what is a 21st century solution to a BC problem? So I took a look at the cultural trends. And if you take a look, and they're even more enlightened now, what you can see is the younger generation is largely against circumcision, whereas the, most, the older generation is largely for circumcision. They think, you know what? It's a good idea to amputate parts of our children's penises. Now, to be fair, the older generation did not grow up in the age of mass information like we did, but we cannot and we will not tolerate these radically ignorant and harmful beliefs. And those who hold on to these archaic beliefs, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, are fools. They are old fools. And they are wrong. They are categorically, unequivocally wrong. And they're stupid too. <laughs> ah. Thankfully, thankfully, it's only the younger generation having children, which is why we've seen this precipitous drop in the circumcision rate by about 40% in the last 40 years. And it continues to fall despite the AAP's despicable lies to prop up the multi-billion dollar genital harvesting industry in this country, which is wild that that exists. Now the corollary to this falling circumcision rate is a cultural trend, which is respect and desire for foreskin or natural anatomy increasing over time. Now this is only natural. Any other position than wanting your entire penis is a position of lunacy. It really is. And so I remember thinking, okay, well, while this cultural trend is happening, this new technological trend is happening called regenerative medicine, where we use stem cells to regrow skin, um, urethras, bladders, hearts, livers, vaginas, kidneys, and so on. Um, and so I thought, okay, as the medical indications treatable with regenerative medicine increase over time, it is only natural that these cultural and technological trends would intersect in a matter of time and produce a regenerated foreskin. What a bizarre solution. What a bizarre solution to a far, far more bizarre problem of an ancient blood sacrifice weaseling its way into the 21st century. How is that even possible? So, so I remember thinking to myself when I was younger, okay, one of these major corporations with money coming out of their pockets must be able to easily recognize this massive economic opportunity. Unfortunately, I was wrong. So I helped get a startup company off the ground called Forgen, which is the only company seeking to adapt the latest advances in regenerative medicine to the only body part, the only body part of great sexual value that over 100 million American men are missing. Now, I don't have time to give you the full business pitch, I gave it at one of the world's largest stem cell um, conferences a few years ago among industry leaders uh, when I was 23. Now, I got a standing ovation, but it didn't quite translate to a $10 million investment yet. But, but the pitch essentially boils down to this. Men invest enormous amounts of value in their penis, which is why I'm up here. Unfortunately, much of that value was stolen from us when we were children. So if we could develop a regenerative therapy that mitigates or eliminates that loss, that would provide an enormous economic opportunity. And as I would argue, an ethical imperative. I don't really care about the money. But if we were successful, we would make enormous amounts of it. 
I think men want larger, more pleasurable, better functioning penises. But, you know, it's just a wild theory I have. <laughs> but besides, besides, on a less capitalistic note, is it not a far more compelling vision to live in a planet where we grow genitals to help people rather than cut them off to damage them? That is a world I would rather be a part of. Now, Now, moving forward though, what is the broader solution? Well, remember the spectrum of acceptable opinion? I think it's fair to say that genital blood sacrifices currently occupy the periphery of that spectrum. Now, I have a modest proposal for the younger generation, which is eliminating genital blood sacrifices from what is deemed acceptable behavior. I know, people call me a radical is to continue to expand the spectrum and include anti-MGM laws and bodily integrity. But that's not good enough. See, bodily integrity is a fundamental human right. It is a pillar of every civilized society. We can either be a civilized society or a circumcising one. But we cannot be both. Now, the way I see it is this. There are 120 million circumcised men in this country. 120 million. One circumcision. One circumcision is an act of extreme sexual violence. 120 million circumcisions? 120 million? circumcisions. That is a culture of sexual violence. And that is what we find ourselves in today. Here's the truth. Whether Jew or Gentile, all children deserve protection. We would live in a much kinder world. A culture more suitable for our children to grow up in. For this culture of sexual violence is not. And while I'm down here, let me tell you a secret. This is how these religious ideologies work. Just as hazing binds fraternities, genital mutilation binds religious groups. The Jews, I know, I'm one of them, are an unmasked genital mutilation cult. That is why we are so clannish. It is our shared delusion of superiority that we must uphold to maintain our perverted tribal identity. Circumcision is the evil that binds us together. Well, let me assure you, it is all a lie. It is an evil lie. And it is hideously damaging our children. I implore, I implore my fellow generation of Jews to accept that we've been lied to, and to stop. For I fear our parents are far too indoctrinated to understand. At least, my father is. Now this, this is my magnum opus, and I stand behind it, and you should join me. Not only is everything I shared with you tonight true, it is obviously true, and it is verifiably true. The entire world understands this very basic information, with the exception of Jewish and Muslim nations. History will vindicate me in the immediate future, whether it takes two months or two years, but I seriously doubt longer than that. The older generations 
with few notable exceptions. The older generations have failed us. They lack both the intelligence to identify this very obvious problem and the integrity to address it. Now, now it falls on us. It falls on you. It falls on the next generation of adults and the next generation of leaders and intellectuals in this room and those of you watching online. Let us welcome all of our children into this world with the love, the respect, and the acceptance that they deserve. And not welcome them into this world with the sexual violence they're met with today. Let us safeguard their fundamental human right to their entire bodies. The only thing they will ever truly own. Let us, please, for the love of our shared humanity, let us not fail them. Thank you.